Oswego was the point of a 19th century revolution in education, pressed forward by an unlikely leader, Edward Austin Sheldon. A memorial bronze statue constructed to honor the founding father of SUNY Oswego welcomes arrivals to Sheldon Hall, the oldest building on campus. The statue was unveiled in 1899 by then New York Governor Theodore Roosevelt and was created by penny contributions from school children throughout the Empire State. So who was Edward Austin Sheldon? Born in October 1823, Sheldon spent much of his youth working on the family farm in Perry Center, New York. At school, Sheldon admittedly hated studying, writing that, I didn't care a fig about learning to spell. I utterly despised learning of all kinds. I regarded grammatical forms of speech as stilted and bombastic. Perhaps it's only fitting then that he should be the one who would forever change the landscape of education and teaching in this country. Sheldon's journey into educational reform began with the founding of the Orphan and Free School Association in Oswego, New York in 1848. Its goal was to address the needs of educating the children of migrant workers who flocked to the bustling port city. However, it was the next step in his journey that provided the spark that would ignite an educational transformation. And that spark was the creation of a free graded school system for every child in Oswego. And with it, a rare opportunity, a chance to revamp the formal memorization system he wanted to find out the best way to train students and he wanted his teachers to understand that what they did made a huge difference in the lives of these children, especially immigrant children. So he looked around, he read widely, he brought in some ideas from Europe and he established on this campus the object learning method. He based his educational model on that of Johann Pestalozzi, the Pestalozzian method of object learning had spread across Europe and into parts of Canada. Like Pestalozzi, Sheldon believed that students needed to become active participants at school, which included observing and discussing their findings with the teacher. To encourage this class participation, all young students were asked to bring in their toys, dolls, and pets from home in order to create a more familiar environment. About literacy, Sheldon believed the following. At first, they will learn the names of animals, or objects, or actions, or pictures, and should be presented to the children and made subjects of familiar conversations before they are spelled out on the board. Teachers would use familiar objects and drawings not only to spark stimulating conversations, but to transform their classrooms from venues of memorization to centers for demonstration. The next step in Sheldon's journey was finding a way to train teachers in this new Oswego method, which led to the establishment of Oswego's primary teacher's training school in 1861. And although the school's initial class consisted of only nine pupils, that would change by the time the Civil War came to an end. The school was growing to meet the needs of an industrialized nation. Some of its graduates migrated south to educate former slaves, as well as the children of plantation owners. In 1866, the school was renamed the Oswego State Normal School, and by 1879, the campus expanded to include science laboratories for chemistry, facilities to teach botany and zoology, as well as a gymnasium. Sheldon said, No such school existed in America and the methods of instruction were quite as new as the design of the school. Like the school, the teachers hired by Sheldon were also distinctive. Probably the most notable was Herman Crusey. Crusey, hired as an industrial arts instructor, also happened to be a colleague of Pestalozzi during his time in Switzerland. His insight into the object learning method would serve Sheldon and the school very well during his tenure. Crusey noted, Mr. Sheldon preserved throughout his career a modest disposition. He never boasted about the work he had performed, even when its success was universally acknowledged. 
On the other hand, he was ever ready to give full credit and praise to the efforts of men who had worked in the same field as his. The early graduating classes of the late 19th century reflected the notion of many Americans during the time that teaching was a vocation best filled by women. The ratio of female to male students during these formative years was a staggering nine to one. But ratios aside, the student population, known as normalites, truly represented America. 14% of the school's graduates came from outside New York. And what makes this percentage perhaps even more impressive were the incredible hardships associated with travel during that time period. The railroad system was growing, but it was far from complete. These facts demonstrate the amount of influence the Oswego method held in the field of education, guided ever so gently by the tireless Sheldon. As one graduate wrote, I love Dr. Edward A. Sheldon for his sympathetic encouragement. In his relations to his students, he was as democratic as Abraham Lincoln. Hanging in my office over my desk is a life-size portrait of Dr. Sheldon. As I enter this room and look into his face, he seems to say, good morning, Mr. Ferris. So beloved was Sheldon that students flocked to his home on Shady Shore to attend annual events, the most popular of which was the annual sugar party. These traditions at Shady Shore extended beyond the boundaries of his tenure at the school. Shady Shore would later become the official home of every SUNY Oswego president. Well, it's a very warm home. You get that feeling the minute you walk in. And we have a big picture of the founder of the campus, Edward Austin Sheldon, hanging on the stairway, uh, the front stairway. So we're always reminded of him. We have some of his writings. And he talks about when he found the property, what it meant to him, how he was eager to build a home here and bring his family here. It's a place that we feel very privileged to live in. As the turn of the century approached, the Oswego method grew in prominence, even finding its way to the 1893 Chicago World's Fair where Sheldon was asked to present his forward-looking view of education and how it would affect the yet-to-be-realized modern age. Edward Austin Sheldon had become one of the world's foremost educators. Even after the death of his beloved wife Frances in the spring of 1896, Sheldon continued to be what in essence he always was, a lifelong learner. His daughter, Mary Sheldon Barnes, remembered fondly and so my father stands among his beehives, thinking, acting yet. And if you ask him about the ideal of a future state, he will answer promptly, smiling at you with his clear and steady eyes. Constant activity. Indeed, he stayed active up to the date of his own death in 1897. Edward Austin Sheldon may be gone, but his legacy continues to far outlive him. His Oswego method not only transformed education, but established one of the finest institutions of higher education in the country as well, SUNY Oswego. <laughs>